So why is hypertrophy training so confusing? Now, there might be some people who say, no, it's simple. Well, I would say that there are actually quite a few variables here at play. Volume, intensity, frequency, exercise selection, tempo, technique, range of motion. There are a lot of decisions that you have to make in the gym. And no, it's not that simple. However, it should also not be confusing. I think a lot of fitness content creators, professionals, coaches, influencers, whatever, they intentionally obfuscate the truth. Yeah, you like that editing? That's how we roll here. Uh, it's totally not because I couldn't pronounce the word. Obfuscate. So in this video, we're going to go over a bunch of different important training variables and talk about why they might be confusing. And we're going to start with volume. Now, volume didn't even have a clear definition up until a few years ago. Greg Knuckles argued within the last decade that it should be sets per muscle group per week. Before that, sometimes it was sets per muscle group per week. Sometimes it was how many reps per muscle group per week. Sometimes it was just how much total weight are you lifting per muscle group per week? Sometimes it wasn't even per week. You do your, your tonnage. Like, oh, how much how much tonnage are you doing on the squat? Oh, I've been doing 5,000 kilos this week. Yeah, that's my volume. And that was just kind of normal. So now we've settled on sets per muscle group per week, and everything should be all cleared up, right? Well, not entirely. Some people do very high volume and grow well. Other people do very low volume comparatively and grow well. You look at Arnold Schwarzenegger versus Mike Menzer, that's the classic comparison of high versus low volume. And they were both pretty freaking jacked. And while I do think that steroids, which we'll get to a little bit later, can make both very low and very high volumes a little bit more manageable for different reasons, even natural lifters are going to have a pretty wide variation in how much volume they can and should do. This is often further confusioned, confusioned, confused by the fact that the science doesn't really completely line up with a lot of what people actually do in the real world. So the science might say, oh, do 30 sets, 40 sets, 50 sets, or more per week to get the best growth. But then almost no one is actually doing that in the real world. Is it just because they're lazy, because they don't have the time? No, a lot of these people are super obsessed, hyper dedicated people where if they thought they needed to grow best from 50 sets, they would do 50 sets. In fact, they might do more to get more, but often they just are not. You see some very, very jacked natural lifters doing like six to eight, certainly less than 10 sets for a muscle group and still growing really well. And this can be confusing because the science is pointing in one direction in a lot of cases, not all cases. Um, but then what people actually do is pointed in a slightly different direction. Then you have rep range. Now the hypertrophy rep range used to be eight to 12. That's all you got. You could do eights, nines, tens, elevens, twelves. You did thirteens, no gains for you. You did sevens, you know, let's get close to strength, but it's not quite strength because strength was one to five. So I guess six and seven reps, you just, I don't know, just nothing happened. And then 15 and up was endurance or muscular endurance. And so, yeah, if you did 13 and 14 reps, sorry, <laughs> you were close to the endurance, but also you went a little bit too far away from hypertrophy. So uh, better luck next time. And so it should be freeing to know that as long as you're working hard, 5 to 30 is a pretty big range. But I think for a lot of people, this is still confusing because that's a really big range and what do you actually do? What do you write down on the piece of paper? Should you be doing your lateral raises for sets of five or your RDLs for sets of 30? Well, absolutely not. That's just ridiculous. Although I've done both of those. I think it's important to know that science is just sort of an average. It's this five to 30. You're in there, you're probably pretty good but there are certainly benefits or drawbacks to certain rep ranges for certain movements most of the time, but then there are exceptions to those rules as well. Next, frequency. Now, the Silver Era guys before steroids, 
they tended to do roughly two to three times per muscle group per week. And so maybe a full body, maybe upper, lower, something like that. Into the golden era, when steroids started becoming popular, often frequency was scaled back. A bro split became very, very popular. And so it was more like once per week frequency. Now, initially, science said, okay, frequency, frequency, frequency. This is what actually matters. You got to get those spikes of muscle protein synthesis. They don't last long. And so you got to be training every probably three, maybe even four, five, six times because when you're advanced that spike in muscle protein synthesis after a workout just doesn't last very long however in the past few years it's come out that hey actually frequency is sort of just a means to accumulate and acquire that tasty amount of volume and so now the scientific consensus is sort of like volume is what matters frequency doesn't really matter but frequency might help you get more volume or get more high quality volume and most natural lifters that I talk to, they kind of have like a minimum of twice per week frequency if you want to bring up an area. I think once per week is enough to maintain, but if you really want to hypertrophize an area, two, three times a week is probably a pretty good place. Hey, it turns out the Silver Air guys, they knew their shit. Next, exercise selection. Now this is one where it is confusing because almost every content creator has certain exercises that they like and some that they don't like. It is very, very individual. It is very, very personal preference heavy. There are movements that other content creators really, really like, and I simply do not. Now, that doesn't mean I'm necessarily doing it wrong. It's just that not everyone is going to enjoy every single movement. And then when you look at the science, more often than not, if you pit two exercises together, usually they're actually going to be fairly close. So if you compare like a push-up to a bench press, eh, to a machine, to dumbbells, to cables, as long as you're pushing hard and you keep the other variables constant, often exercise selection doesn't seem to matter. Except it absolutely does from an individual perspective. Again, science is telling you the average, and I think on average... Sure, if you compare like a machine chest press to a barbell, to dumbbells, to cables, to whatever, you're probably going to see pretty similar results across the board. But that doesn't mean for you that it's not going to matter. It absolutely, probably will. And to do what gets you fired up, because that means this obsession, each session in question will get you that aggression that you need for progression. Next, how hard are you pushing each set? So RPE, RIR, how close to or even beyond failure are you pushing each set? Now, for a while, science would say, oh, no, keep like two, three, even like four or five reps in reserve and then just do more volume. And again, this was kind of at odds to how most bodybuilders trained. Most bodybuilders were pushing stuff at least until things slowed down considerably and then you saw so some people who are especially these high intensity guys they're pushing beyond failure so they're doing drop sets they're getting partners to assist up the weight they're going full tom platt's ham bone on the weight and i could see how this might be confusing because during the set you have to stop at some point okay otherwise we would all just be lifting right now at some point this set has to stop does it stop five reps before failure a few reps before failure, two, one, just before failure, not actually failing. Do you actually try that rep and fail? What do you do then? Do you just stop and go home? Do you do rest pause? Do you do partials? Do you call someone over and get them to slap you in the face to get more stimulus? Like, what do you do in the moment? And so this can be a little bit challenging to decide, especially in the heat of battle. Next, you have range of motion. So when you're doing your actual reps... How do you actually do them? Now, for a long time, full range of motion was sort of the uh, typical advice. But then you look at some of the biggest dudes ever, and they're not actually following that advice. So if it was so important, well, why is not everyone doing it? By the way, this video is sponsored by Boost Camp. So one thing almost all successful lifters have in common is keeping a training log. You need to be tracking your progress over time because progressive overload usually doesn't just happen. It would be nice, 
but you should be measuring things and being observant in order to get the most out of your training. Plus, you get access to some of the best training plans out there. I have three totally free programs out there, plus my new program out there, which is a premium program. Thank you to everyone who has signed up for that. Feedback has already been really, really good. And so thank you to Bootcamp for sponsoring this video. And then you have, oh, it's actually just the lengthened part that is most important. So let's just chop out everything else and do only the lengthened part of the range of motion. Um, I don't think that's the end of the world. I did it and, it, you know, it seemed okay. I would say don't avoid the hard part of the range of motion. That's probably a better overall summary. If you are squatting super high because squatting deep is challenging, you're probably messing up. If you're benching high like this, again, to avoid that deep part of the range of motion, you're probably messing up. But if you are maybe not completely dive bombing your presses and you're keeping it here because that is where it is most challenging, I would say that is totally fine, even if it's not the most lengthened or the most full range of motion possible. Then you have tempo and overall technique. This is super individual. You have some of these high intensity guys saying like, no, you need to do slow lowerings, like 10 seconds, super slow training where even the positive is slow. And other people, they seem to actually lift very, very quickly. You look at you know, Ronnie Coleman, he's kind of just going, he's just tossing the weight around. Arnold, he's just pumping weight. He's literally just pumping iron. And so there is a wide variety of tempos and techniques that can work. And this, again, should be freeing but for a lot of people, it is simply confusing because they look around and they think, okay, well, what do I do? Then you have steroids. Now, especially when combined with the next one, which some people might already be able to guess what it is. If you see someone who looks ridiculous, like they're just red and vascular and absolutely massive, they're probably on gear. Now, that could mean that they know their shit about training and they're a really good source of information, but not necessarily. Also, there's a whole bunch of people who look like eh, who are on steroids. And so they don't really know what they're doing. It's just the drugs which are driving the progress. And I don't want to sound like a steroid salesman, but they work really, really well. We've all seen that study where the group that didn't lift but took steroids grew more than the group who did train but we're natural. So they do make a big difference, and this can be confusing, especially if you're not in the know with what your favorite fitness influencer might be doing. And again, as I always say, there are some enhanced lifters who are fantastic sources of information, but it's sort of hard to parse that out if you are natural and a beginner to lifting. It's really hard to tell who is a good source of information and who is totally full of crap and is just relying on the drugs or just wants to sell shit or supplements or whatever, or even sell SARMs and other shit nowadays. So the culture has changed a lot in the past 10 years and you got to be careful about who you get your information from. Then you combine it with number nine, genetics. I actually thought about doing a series, not natty or not, but genetty or not, like what are your genetics? And you don't know. You don't know until you've trained for a long time, but it does matter. I mean, no one, I certainly have never said that genetics don't matter. They certainly matter quite a lot, especially when it comes to some things like the size or like exactly how everything inserts. I've seen a lot of people where on the client questionnaire, they say stuff like, this is my goal physique. And the guy in question is like David Laid with this tiny little waist. And then I see there before and it's like, Wah. and it's, um, it's just not going to happen. A lot of stuff like structure insertions, muscle bellies, you can't really change those with training. And this can be confusing as a beginner, especially because you just don't really know. You don't have really considered these things. You don't really have an experience in the gym or even just deciphering the potion that is training. And so you kind of just think, okay, well, he looks good. I want to look like this guy without realizing that as cliche as it sounds, you can only look like the best version of yourself. So my advice to simplify a lot of this and to make it less confusing is to simply look at this as stimulus. So a lot of people ask me questions about volume, intensity, frequency, all these different training variables. Think of it as simply stimulus. So you do more volume, it is more stimulus. 
You do that volume harder, it is more stimulus. If you do a more difficult exercise, it's more stimulus. If you use more range of motion, it's going to be more stimulus. So, for example, if you're doing a Romanian deadlift, heavy, really sitting back and getting that big stretch in the lengthened position, you're not going to be doing 50 sets of that, especially if you're going near or to failure. It's just a bigger stimulus. Dr. Eric Helms and Dr. Eric Trexler had a really good Iron Culture podcast episode about this recently, where it's not just the volume that you do. A lot of people are hyper fixated on how many sets per week, but it's how hard you push them. It's how close to failure you are going. It's the exact exercise in question. It's the technique that you are using. If you don't push the set and you have crap technique, yeah, you can probably do a lot of sets because every set is not actually as much fatigue or as much stimulus. So you have to look at your training holistically. You have to look at what can you recover from and benefit from. And then you have to kind of just break this down, all these different training variables, just as levers that you pull. Alexander Bromley has talked about this before as well, where, okay, more volume, okay, but I have to do something else to compensate. Okay, now I keep a couple reps in reserve. But I bring the volume down, now I can push harder. Or now I can push more frequently. Oh, now I'm training less frequently, I can do more volume. And so you have a baseline amount of stress that you can recover from. And yes, hypertrophy is quite forgiving in terms of the variables, in terms of, yeah, there are a whole bunch of different combinations that you can use, but that is part of what makes it so confusing. It's not just three sets of 10 on this movement. There's a whole bunch of movements. There's a whole bunch of set ranges. There's a whole bunch of rep ranges. There's a whole bunch of tempos that can all work really, really well. And this is part of why lifters get paralysis by over analysis, because there are a lot of correct answers, but people want the best answer without realizing you never know if you have the best answer or not, because there are so many variables and they all have a pretty decent range in which they are acceptable. Plus it is individual. So what works for one person might not work for another. And so yes, there is flexibility, but it is also going to be up to you to find out your best training formula. So my advice would be to go in there, write something down for three months or follow a fixed program, be observant, see how the results were, obviously keep a training log on Boost Camp, and that is what you need to do. It's not just look at this study, it's not what did this person do, those are at best hints for pushing you in the right direction, but they are no guarantee of success. Ultimately, the only person who you need to be following is yourself and me. Another good example, and I just thought of this when walking around and editing this video, was a discussion between Jeff Alberts and Dr. Eric Helms about their training, and they train wildly differently. Both very successful natural lifters, both extremely jacked, and yet their training is very, very different. One super high volume, one super low volume, and they've trained together, they've tried the other, the other's training situation, and it just didn't work. And so you really do have to find your own path. Sometimes you know you're a, you're a workhorse for your lower body and a racehorse for your upper body or vice versa. And, um, you know, it might take half a decade to really find your stride, and that's totally okay and totally normal. But you got to give yourself that opportunity to find that path rather than just either giving up or hopping on the sauce or... You know, saying, oh, it's all genetics or it's all steroids. No, like, once you find your own training formula, things usually take off pretty well from there. So is training simple? No. Anyone who says training is simple or just says shut up and lift, they are probably not getting very good results. They are likely intermediate or super hyper genetically gifted or on the sizzle. Training details do matter. So check out my books. I will leave them a, in a link in a pinned comment down below. Thank you so much for the support. Enjoy your new gains, and I'll see you in the next video. Peace.